Well, amen. If you have your Bible, will you turn with me to the book of Job? Job chapter 1. To our guests this summer, we've been having a sermon series. I think I entitled it, You Asked For It. I simply asked our congregation for some sermon ideas and topics, and this was presented. And I think it's always a good time to study the book of Job. The book of Job is sad, church. It may be a familiar book, but it is filled with sad events, suffering, and at times these events and conversations, they can be depressing. And of these 42 chapters in this book, it is not until the very end that we get a glimpse of hope and joy and happiness. Um, So I don't know what you're going through, but there's hope at the end of that storm, friend. Now, Now, Job is one of the five wisdom books in the Bible for our um, Bible scholars here, you know, Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and Job. Most people, when they think of Job, they don't think of those types of wisdom. It's said that Psalms teaches us how to worship, pray. Proverbs teaches us how to behave. Song of Solomon teaches us how to love. Ecclesiastes teaches us how to live, but the book of Job teaches us how to suffer. And as we look at this wonderful book, I think there are some important truths that no matter where you're at in life, that can help you even now. In pastoral ministry, I get to walk with you in life. I get to see a lot. I get to see the births and the deaths, the joys, the sicknesses, the times that we can celebrate, the cancers, the good times and the bad. And really, as we are a church that is close together, we're all going through that stuff together. We're going through life, and we experience ups, and we experience downs, but we do all this in the name and in the power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what we could even do is, and this is probably a good idea, we could have a moment of testimony where you can share how in those moments of trials and tribulations, how God saw you through and how he helped you. And at the end of the storm, you realize many things about God and who you are. If we could only share those things, I just want to encourage you, don't forget it. Don't forget the things that God has done for you. We need to appreciate our sovereign God. And that's the title of this message, Suffering and the Sovereignty of God. But before we jump in, let's, let's pray and ask the Lord's blessings. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your peace. Teach us now, Father, and give us wisdom, the wisdom that we need in life and in suffering and through difficult times. Father, forgive us when we lack faith. Forgive us of all our sins. But Lord, may in those difficult times we lean on you more than ever. Father, I pray that you would save the lost. Revive your church in Jesus' name. Now all God's people said, C.S. Lewis, he once said, he was once asked, why do the righteous suffer? And Lewis replied, why not? 
they're the only ones that can take it. Uh, as I think about life, I really cannot comprehend how an unbeliever can go through the difficulties of life. Although they do, it's hard for me to understand. But it is such a true statement for us, C.S. Lewis's response. Why can't we go through the trials of life? You know, often when we share the gospel with people, and this is one of the, the great oppositions to, to, to God, or, or so they say. Why, if God is good, do bad things happen? Why, if God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, if He is truly good, an omnibenevolent God, then why do bad things happen? People wrestle with that, and, and many times they come out on the, the wrong side uh, of the question. Uh, I would just turn them to the book of Job, and we can see God's sovereignty and God working through the entire situation, whether we think it's good or bad. Church, what we will learn in this book that this man, Job, remained faithful. And he understood those things, that God was in control. Now, if you found your place in Job chapter 1, let's begin reading the first five verses. It says, There was a man in the land of Uz, his name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters, he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. And I would say greatest may mean richest or wealthiest. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one, on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually, thus Job continued, I think we could say, to walk with the Lord. The book of Job begins describing this man named Job. The word Job, his name means hated or persecuted. Some have questioned if that was his name at all. Maybe it's just a nickname given to him by some of his loyal friends, we could call them. But his name means a lot as we will go through this book and, and, and consider what he went through, that he was persecuted. And we, we believe that that's because of his faith in God. Now we need to begin by understanding that Job was an actual person. He's not some allegory. Job is not a figurative person. But this was a real man. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, it lists Job, Noah, and Daniel referring to their righteousness. James, chapter 5, verse 11, it tells us to be reminded of Job's steadfastness. So we will do what James encourage us, encourages us to do. We will be reminded of Job's steadfastness, and I want to encourage you to be steadfast in suffering. Now it's said that, that Job is the oldest book in the Bible written. Many people, they automatically think Genesis, but Job 
It's often understood as the first book of the Bible ever written, and Job is understood to have lived in, during the patriarchal period, during the time of Abraham and his family. So this story is of old, is of old, and of ancient times. And we, what we learn in these first five verses about Job is a few things. First, he was wealthy. And we know with, when we look in the book of Genesis, when it describes wealth, especially of, of Abraham and the patriarchs, their wealth was described in how much livestock they had. Job had a lot of stuff. He was rich. And it says he was the greatest in all of the East. So he had many possessions, but he also had a large family. He had a wife and ten children. That's a pretty big family. I can barely handle these three. I couldn't handle seven more. So he had a large family, but what's most important about Job and in, in his life was that he was a man of faith. The it is described that Job was blameless and upright and he feared God and he turned away from evil. If that could be said of us, amen, praise the Lord. He was blameless, not that he was perfect, but he, he sought holiness before a thrice holy God. And he not only did the right things, he, he chose not to do the wrong things, if you notice what he says. In the Christian life, there are things we do, but there are things that we don't do. There are sins of commission and there are sins of omission. So this man is a man of faith. He is blameless, but he's not perfect. But his life was one, as you see at the end of verse 5, that he did these things Continually. This is a wise saying. The righteous will suffer. I do not comprehend, I do not understand, and I don't know where they come up with this stuff that says that if you're a child of God, you will not suffer. I do not know where that doctrine comes from. That if you simply have enough faith, then your life will be perfect. That's not what the Bible says. God had one and only begotten Son, and His only Son suffered, so why should we expect anything any different? And He had 12 followers, and those 12 followers, Judas died, He killed Himself, and the one who replaced Him, they suffered. How can we expect anything different? And Jesus warns us, the New Testament warns us in the old that we will suffer, the righteous friends will suffer. But in suffering, we grow. Okay? When we go through stuff, we grow. Those roots of our faith, they go even deeper. As a, as a storm rushes against the seashore and there are trees there, it, it is only the trees with the deepest roots that continue to stand. And so in the storms, God is accomplishing something. We are growing. This entire book, this wisdom here about suffering, God is doing something in the life of the righteous. G.K. Chesterton said this, quote, he says, Jesus promised the disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. So we will suffer. We will suffer even though we have faith in God. And I... I guess I mean to ask, I don't know who would ever think that carrying the cross of Jesus would be easy. 
Because Jesus says, whoever desires to come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. And if you carry the cross of Christ, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Let's continue to see how this story unfolds. Verse 6. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? And Satan answered to the, to the Lord and said, from going to and from on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But you stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has, Job, has is in your hand. Only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. I find this fascinating. This is so interesting. That there is this day that the sons of God, and these are the angels of God, they present themselves before the Lord, and Satan comes. We have this conversation here between God and Satan. We, we learn a few things about Satan in these verses. First, Satan is subordinate to God. He reports to God. God is over Satan. Satan is not over God because Satan is seen here, and the text says that he is presenting himself to the Lord, just like the other angels. Something else we learn, that Satan goes to and fro on the earth. I think the implication is this, that, that Satan is not omnipresent. He's not, he does not have the power of God to be at all places, at all times. Satan is here, Satan is there, and he is coming and he's going, but he is limited in his presence on this earth. Also, Satan coming and going on the earth tells us something else. Satan is not in hell. One day that will be his final destination. He is predestined to go to hell by according to the will of our sovereign God, but he's not in hell yet. John chapter 12, John chapter 14 calls Satan the ruler of this world. This world that you are living in right now, the Bible says Satan is the ruler of this world. So Satan is subordinate to God. He's not in hell. He's on earth. He's confined to one place, one location. And, and, and I will even say this. Often when people say that Satan is attacking them, I kind of question that. Is God attacking you here and those in India right now? And those in, in New York City and those in South America? Friends, Satan might have bigger things, bigger fish to fry. Now he does have demons, lots of demons, and, and he can... Send those demons out to do other things. But we don't know for sure that Satan himself is oppressing us. But he has a large army behind him. A third of heaven fell from heaven, and they're at work right now thwart trying to, and they never will succeed, to thwart the things of God. We see Satan here. We learn some things, that, that he is our adversary. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Your adversary, the devil, prowls around. He does oppose God. He does oppose the church. And he opposes us. 
he's got a pretty good strategy that we don't fully comprehend. We need to recognize these truths about Satan. And as we gain wisdom here, consider this. Job knows nothing about this conversation. Job knows nothing that God and Satan had talked and that God had permitted Satan to do this, but Job remained faithful. And often in our trials and often in our storms, we don't know. We don't know the conversations that God has had. We don't know if God has spoke to Satan about us and our faithfulness. We don't know. But it's okay. What I do know is that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and He is with me no matter what I go through in life. It's about what I know, and it's about who I know. We know God is sovereign. He's in control. God initiates this. It is God who says, speaks to Satan first, and it is God, notice this, who offers Job to to, to Satan, and Job is faithful. The righteous will suffer, but we do not suffer outside the will of God. Let me say that again. The righteous will suffer, but we will not suffer outside of the will of God. God is in control. Have peace in that alone. And I just want you to, as you, we walk through these, recognize God working. Now next notice, the righteous suffer in various ways. And this man, Job, goes through a lot. Look at verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house and there came a messenger to Job and said the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword and I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking there came another and said the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell upon the young people. And they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Suffering. Speaking of suffering, Job's suffering is monumental. Job, he first suffers financially. All his riches are taken from him. His livestock, it says, his sheep, his camels, they are destroyed. Even his servants, whether you want to consider his servants, his possessions or his family, they are killed Two, but all that Job had, all of his possessions were taken away in a moment, and he hears this in one conversation. Friends, maybe you've been there. Maybe you've had everything taken away from you. Maybe it's a storm, a literal storm, a hurricane, a tornado, maybe a house fire. I've been there with a house fire. It is devastating. One moment you have everything, and the next moment it's all gone. And we had nothing. 
one moment Job was wealthy, the greatest in all the land, and the next moment he's hearing about this. But not only financially, his family, it, it says that his children were eating and drinking. They, they were fellowshipping, and the, a great wind came, a literal storm came, and, dis, and killed all ten of his children. They were killed. No parent should ever have to go through this. No parent should ever have to endure the loss of a child. Losing your children, your spouse, your family. We've all dealt with that. But that's not the end of Job's suffering. Verse 20 and Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground at worship. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Remember those verses. He says, God gave me life. From my mother's womb, God gives and God takes away. And this is what Job, Job does. He doesn't sin. He does not sin or charge God with wrong. What we cannot do when suffering comes is charge God with wrong. He's God and He is good and He is holy, but He is not wrong. So we... We, we would hope that we respond this way, but often we don't. We are to grieve. We, we should grieve. It is right for us to grieve, especially men. When you lose a loved one, it, it is a good thing. God created us with this capacity to grieve and to cry and to, to go through those difficult times. Yet in those difficult times, we acknowledge and we worship God falling down at his feet. God, you've brought me in this world. You've given to me and you shall take away. God forbid that we sin. Friends, your suffering will do one of two things. It will either bring you closer to God or it will either drive you away from God. Suffering is a good test. It, it, it is a test in a sense where, where, where God is refining us and sanctifying us, but I think it's another good test to show if we are of the faith. That when tough times come, are we going to do it in our own strength or are we going to have faith in God Himself? Child of God, how will you respond when suffering comes? We have the second encounter with God and Satan in verse chapter 2. Again, there was a day, verse 1, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job here? Here again, God is offering, presenting the righteous Job to Satan. Have you considered, my servant Job, that there is none like him on earth? A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil, he still holds fast the integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan tried. He tried by taking his finances, his livestock. He tried by taking his servants, killing his servants. He, he tried by killing his children. 
He tried. But he wasn't done yet. So he thinks about it. That if he can just make Job suffer, Satan really thinks that if he could attack Job physically, that Job would deny God. That he would lose his faith. So God allows him, Satan, but God's only charge here is that he would not kill Job. And it says in verse 7, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, Speak, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive evil? And don't forget this last verse. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. The various ways that Job suffered. He suffered financially. He suffered with his family. Now he suffers in his flesh. Physically. Satan strikes Job so awfully from the top of his head to the soles of his feet with sores, with boils, and his flesh was so bad. It was so bad he had to take broken pottery to scrape his skin. And all, we see some other indications about how bad this was later on in the book. In chapter 7, verse 5, Job says, My flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens and breaks out afresh. Worms. His condition is so bad, he is covered in worms. We could say this is maggots eating at his flesh. Chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions. This suffering of Job physically is affecting him in his dreams. He's having nightmares. It says, uh, he, it terrifies me with these visions. If you've had night terrors, this is agonizing. Job 30, verse 30, it says it's so bad his, sin, his skin is turning black and it falls from me and my bones burn with heat. This man loses everything. He suffers. Wealth, health, family, except his wife and maybe he is second guessing her. Because she tells him to deny God. But in all of this, as awful as it is, Job did not sin with his lips. Church, as we close, as we just kind of surmise this, understand God is sovereign in your suffering. I've said it before and you've heard it a lot. Either you are about to go in a storm, you're in a storm, or you just came out of a storm. It's coming. And it's coming, and it's going to be hard. And it's coming, and we need to go through it together. And it's coming, and our God is sovereign over it. Your suffering does not occur outside of the will and sovereign plan of a holy God. He knows. Satan goes to and fro, but our God is everywhere. He's in this place. And child of God, child of God, as you are in the storm, the presence of our God resides within us because we are the temple of the living God. Friends, there's nothing that you go through that's taking God by surprise. It may take you by surprise, but not Him. And He allows, and He permits, and He uses 
suffering to accomplish something. He uses your suffering for a purpose. Don't waste it. When we lose our, our wealth, when we get sick, when cancer comes, when our loved ones die, God is accomplishing something. And on the other side of that suffering, there is something good. And as Job did not know and fully understand, we don't either. But what he is doing, we know this. God is God and we are not. What he is doing. We'll talk about that a little more next Sunday. Because we will see various reasons given for suffering. Why Satan uses suffering, what Job's wife says, what his friends say, what Elihu says, what Job, how Job questions God, and ultimately the reason given by God of why Job suffers. And here's the plug God never tells him, God never gives him the answer of why these bad things happen. Child of God, I, I know you're going through a lot. But it's better to go through a lot when God's there. And may the wisdom in these things prepare you, encourage you, and, in strength, and strengthen you for the days to come. Let's pray as the economy.